but I would caution someone to say, oh, look at this slam dunk against uh, Catholics. Right. Look, at, look at this. Can I ask Charles Spurgeon or C.S. Lewis to pray for you? These were people who worshiped Mary as a goddess. Mm. And, he, and they were, when you meet Jesus, there will be another person there who will look like him. Where, where does it say that? Bruce Lawn. Hit me a clip. This All will right. be fun. The whole distinction made within Roman Catholicism. We don't worship Mary. We give her hyperdulia. How many people have any idea what in the world that's supposed to mean? The issue of dulia and latria. The distinction that Rome uses in saying, oh, we're not worshiping Mary because we're not giving her latria. We're giving her hyperdulia. My little book, Mary, Another Redeemer, dedicated to Rick Walson. Look at that. 1998, I was a hospital chaplain. I, w I walk into the chapel that we had and I saw this book stuck into the chairs in the chapel. And that's why I still got it today. I could go into the room and get it. I, I know where it is. So I backed up and started from the beginning. Here's what it said. Oh, a small booklet tucked in the fold of a chair in the corner caught my eye. It was sticking out just enough, or I may not have even seen it. Intrigued, I pulled it out. The blue and white cover bore the title, Devotions in Honor of Our Mother of Perpetual Help. I scanned through a few of the prayers. In one of them, I spotted the words, My Eternal Salvation. So I backed up and started from the beginning. O Mother of Perpetual Help, thou art the dispenser of all the goods which God grants to us miserable sinners. And for this reason, he has made thee so powerful, so rich, and so bountiful, that thou mayest help us in our misery. Thou art the advocate of the most wretched and abandoned sinners who have recourse to thee. Come then to my help, dearest mother for I recommend myself to thee. In thy hands I place my eternal salvation, and to thee do I entrust my soul. Count me among thy most devoted servants. Take me under thy protection, and it is enough for me. For if thou protect me, dear mother, I fear nothing, not from my sins, because thou wilt obtain from me the pardon of them, nor from the devils, because thou art more powerful than all hell together, nor even from Jesus, my judge himself, because by one prayer from thee he will be appeased. But one thing I fear, that in the hour of temptation I may neglect to call on thee, and thus perish miserably. Obtain for me then the pardon of my sins, love for Jesus, final perseverance, and the grace always to have recourse to thee, O mother of perpetual help. At first, I could not believe what I just read, so I ran back to the last few lines. Was this prayer really saying that the petitioner did not fear his or her sins, the devil's nor Jesus? That's what it said. I shook my head in disbelief. A few years later, I found myself on a radio station in Boston, Massachusetts, doing a radio discussion with a former Protestant turned Roman Catholic named Jerry Maditix. The topic was Mary and the Saints. Mr. Maditix and I were scheduled to do two public debates at Boston College over the course of the next week, which of course we did. But that day, we were live on the air taking calls on the subject of prayers to Mary and the Saints. As I packed up for the trip, I found a little blue and white booklet and decided to bring it along. Now I reached into my bag and brought it out. Surely, quoting this prayer would bring a strong reaction from Mr. Maditix. Surely he denied that such a prayer is proper, and that the people who had written it were simply going overboard in their piety. The top Talk show host gasped involuntarily as I read the final lines, and as I put down the book it, book, booklet, I looked across to my opponent, waiting for the expected reaction. The host likewise turned to Mr. Maditix. He was quiet for a moment, and then he spoke. Mr. White, he began, I can only hope that someday you too will pray that prayer. So from the sounds of that, it's, mm -hmm. very, it's very confusing on where that line is between honor, which I'm all for honor, right, right, and a divine-like worship. And so right. James White, and again, is, is this a straw man he's making that you guys it, worship Well, Mary? this is this is a rhetorical flourish. Uh -huh. uh, James is an accomplished debater. We had a fun debate. Uh, several which I, years ago. I can't wait to go back yeah, and watch. Yeah, uh, that one was on an issue that actually Protest, some Protestants disagree with him on whether you can lose your salvation. So we had a we had a fun engagement sure. on that. So what he is saying here, there's there's a lot to break down. But I would caution someone to say, oh, look at this slam dunk against uh, Catholics. Right. Look at look at this prayer. You know, they, they worship Mary, this or that. I mean, imagine an atheist who sat down with you in a radio interview and says, so you believe the Bible is the word of God, right? Yeah, yeah, of course I do. Okay, flip over here, First Samuel 15, and you shall slay the Amalekites, men, women, and children. Sure, Leave nothing sure. that breathes. <laughs> so is that the word of God? Yeah, yeah. And you would immediately say, well, let's just back up a little yep, bit. Yep, so yep, yep. it's something. So, so is that? Is that is, it so I would say maybe there's hyperbole there. Maybe it's a literary device. Well, so you would. So there's forth. a lot that you would want to explain, yes. and you would feel like it wouldn't be great to just pick this one thing that does offend sensibility, uh -huh. and to say you're right. That's that can offend sensibility. Let's walk through it. Let's mm -hmm. walk through it. And it takes longer to walk through than just to read the thing that offends one's sensibilities. There's lots of things in the Bible. You read it, you're like, what is that about? Yeah, yeah. But you have to take a step back and work through it. And so what I would say here, if I worked through what he's reading from is, is a prayer of Marian devotion. And he's right that you could just say, yeah, this particular prayer is uh, overly pious to the point that it's a little fuzzy on what is and isn't appropriate. Now, I don't think that that is the case, actually. I was going to say, is it intended to be kind of poetic? Like, is there some poetry happening there? Or like, I don't know how you got, like, how those are written or who's, who's writing them. Well, so that's first, why I'm asking. We have to establish baseline principles before we can understand this. So like principle number one would be, can Christians... Christians help one another through our prayers. Yes. Yeah, no, that, now that seems interesting right there. It's like, why would you ask for a man to pray to you when you have direct access to the Son of God himself to help well, you? I think it would be, can dead Christians help us get, access, get better prayers? Sure, but, no, but what's interesting here is, even still, uh -huh. we would affirm, okay, we are one body, yes. and 
not just that we pr- we, we pray for each other, and it does help each other. Amen. We really do help each other, but that it's not egalitarian. That some people's prayers are more powerful than others. Sure. In James five sixteen, I referenced earlier, it says the prayers of a righteous, righteous person man, are powerful. Yeah. Amen. When when Job and his friends in the book of Job, when his friends are giving him awful advice, and God shows up at the end in Job thirty eight, he's mad at his friends for Job's friends for speaking ill of God, mm-hmm. and so he tells the friends, "Have Job pray for you, for I will hear his prayers." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, when we as Christians pray for one another. The more holy we are, Mm -hmm. the more efficacious our prayers are for each other. Mm -hmm. So then, if those who are, you said that those who are dead, if I would say if someone is in heaven, they are more alive in Christ than I am now. Okay. And that's that's interesting. That's an interesting way to kind of. Before, for yeah. example, in Hebrews chapter eleven, it talks about all the heroes of the faith, like uh-huh. Gideon. What well, they did by faith, Gideon, sure, sure, David, sure. Ha- Moses. the Hall of Faith, we would call it. That's yeah. right. And what's interesting here is that when Hebrews was written, there were no chapter divisions. Yep. That was added later. Later. So Hebrews eleven, you have the Hall of Fame, and then Hebrews twelve one mm-hmm. says this: Since then, we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Mm-hmm. Let us continue to run the race with perseverance. Mm-hmm. So Hebrews is affirming that those he- heroes in the Hall of Fame, they're cheering us on and watching us right now, mm-hmm. that they're aware of this and that they're continuing to pray for us. And so, and does, Hebrews— Does it say they're continuing to pray for us, or does, well, that they're watching us? It says, yeah, you're right. It says that they are witnesses of us. Yes. But then we would look to other places to see, for example, the intercessions in the Book of Revelation of the souls of the martyrs in heaven, uh-huh. that they cry out for the blood that is being spilled on earth, and that their prayers, the prayers of the elders in heaven in the book of Revelation, is being brought before God. Uh And so I would say that if if we see, if it makes sense that we are still able to pray for one another while we are in heaven, Mm -hmm. and we are all connected to the vine, Mm -hmm. the branches of the true vine, and and Jesus conquered death, so that doesn't separate us from each other. Mm. We're all still connected to Christ. We're able to continue those prayers for one another, and they're more powerful. Hebrews 12 says that, those who are in heaven, they are the spirits of just men made perfect. But then finally, who in heaven amongst all of the saints is going to have the closest relationship with God? It's going to be the, the, the woman who bore him. Yes, yeah. That, yes, that when you meet Jesus, there will be another person there who will look like him. I, that blows my mind. Where, where does it say that? Well, no, if Mary's the mother of God. Mary, Mary and Jesus are going to look like each other. They're genetically related. I got you. Okay, that's what I mean. Got you. Got you. Got you. But we don't. It, it, that's to, inter- okay, okay. Okay. To see the beauty of the incarnation there, mm-hmm. that Mary, you know, will, that will see that, and so that prayer that James is reciting. So if we, if you believe these previous principles, Christians can pray for one another. The holier you are, the more efficacious your prayers are. Death doesn't prevent us from interceding. Yeah. Then we ask for this intercession help. And so when it says, I don't even fear Jesus because I have Mary, the point the prayer is making is that unlike Jesus has the power to damn us, uh-huh. Mary does not. Uh-huh. And so we're, we ask, and there's other cultures where intercess, intercessors are more normal. In America, we just think, I'm going to go to the manager myself. But like in the, the Philippines, for example, the cultures vary. If you have a problem with somebody, uh-huh. you ask aunt so-and-so to go talk to them. Uh-huh. There's other cultures where intercession is a more natural thing when you have conflict. That's in this prayer is saying that we as a one body in Christ, Galatians 6 2 says we carry one another's burdens. Mm-hmm. And so we can ask those who have triumphed over over sin, who are in heaven victoriously, to pray for us and lead us closer to Christ. And Mary is special in that regard because just like at the, at the cross when John is entrusted to her, mm-hmm. uh, behold your mother. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That that's not just like uh, poetry, it's that. Mary is the first Christian to receive the first person to receive Jesus. Mm-hmm. And so she's now the mother of John, the mother of the apostles. She's the mother of all Christians that what she does now for the rest of it, you know, for the rest of this age yeah. is to pray and lead us to her son. So could I ask Charles Spurgeon or C.S. Lewis to pray for me? Yeah, you could ask, uh, as long as the person hasn't hasn't been condemned as like a heretic. Sure. But the church would allow now you as a private individual have a lot of freedom to ask for people that you think are in heaven to pray for you. Like, uh-huh. to ask, let's say you have deceased parents that uh-huh. are in heaven. I think it's quite natural that, you know, if your mom's in heaven, mom, pray for me, I'm, you know, so help me out with this. Yeah, yeah I, I guess I have just never saw the, yeah, I just always thought there was like, you know, hey, they're up there, and I'm down here, and I don't really talk to them like that, you know? The idea is that, and normally we would be that separated, uh-huh. If not for the union we have in Christ, because, in the mystical okay. body of Christ, Got it. as what unites all of us together, so that because remember the, the the Bible says there's one body of Christ, there's only one body. Yeah. So if those in heaven belong to the body, yeah. and we belong to the body, we all belong to that same body. And Protestants are in on that body. 
Yes, they are. Yeah. Now, uh, if you are in, if you have a valid baptism, yeah. and most Protestants do, uh, but I would say that it goes back to what I said earlier about having that imperfect communion with Christ sure. Church. But I, I, and I admit that Marian devotion, it can be hard. But remember when you said going back to church history? Mm-hmm. You're prayer, looking at it through but, the lens right, of church Right, because history. the prayer that yeah. James read, he makes it sound like it's just crazy Catholics from the Middle Ages. <laughs> but the earliest liturgical prayer we have ever found uh-huh. in the early church, it's been dated to about the year 250 AD. It's called the Subtuum Presidium in, in Latin. It means beneath thy protection. Uh-huh. This earliest liturgical prayer from the third century is a prayer to Mary. Got it. It says, O Mary, oh, it says, O Theotokos, I f- flee to thee beneath thy protection to pray and seek refuge. Yeah. And there, and so there it's like, okay, if we do value church history along with scripture, do we also value that the, the first Christians recognize this kind of veneration? Now you're right though, where it goes too far. I'll give you an example. In the early church, so it's like 5th century, 4th, 5th century, St. Epiphanius wrote a whole book about heresies mm-hmm. of all different kinds in his day. One of them were called the Coloridians. These were people who worshipped Mary as a goddess, mm. and, he, and they were condemned as heretics. And what, where they crossed the line was they offered bread on an altar for her. Uh-huh. So, we so would, there is a place where you, the, uh-uh, too much. So the line would be, uh, one line would be sacrifice. Yeah. Do you only offer sacrifice to God? Uh-huh. So our Eucharistic sacrifice is only presented Christ on the altar through the Holy Spirit to the Father. Mm. You may not offer a sacrifice to anyone else. Amen. But we do venerate and we recognize, like we recognize other things as, as as being the works of God, whether they're people or things. Like I know sometimes people with, with Catholics, like, oh, you're into statues and relics and things like that. All of these things, we look to these things to show what God has done through the Holy Spirit, through the lives of the saints, through salvation history, to take us to God. Yeah. Uh, even like the relics, like like imagine if if you had, if I had the true cross here, mm-hmm. like we discovered it, we carbon dated it, yeah. this is the cross yeah. Jesus died on. Yeah. How would you act? Like, yeah. pre- I mean, that'd be nuts. But like, wouldn't you be emotional? Yeah. Touch it? I'm about to go to it? J- Jerusalem. You are? Israel. Yeah. So I'm de- I, I, I get it. I'm following. Have you ever yeah. been before? Never been before. Dude. So I'm super pumped. I've been I've been twice. Yeah. But you go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and it is just something else. And the, only, the strongest religious experience I ever had there was praying on the Rock of Calvary mm. at that very moment. But imagine like we had, we carbon dated it, put all the pieces back together. Here's the true cross. Yeah. We would sh- we wouldn't work now. Some people you could be some come so emotional. You might be on your knees crying, mm-hmm. thanking God, touching it, and a Muslim might say, "Oh, you're worshiping that cross." Mm-hmm. You say, "No, I'm not worshiping the cross. I'm I'm just so grateful that God used this to save me from my sins." Yep. And just as the cross was a means by which God conquered sin, Mary was the means because it was through her Christ truly became man through the mm. incarnation. Yeah. And so we have that similar veneration because God could have not used, he could have used something besides the cross sure. to save us. Sure. He could have used someone besides Mary, but he chose these specific means. And so we we show our gratitude and veneration for that and that they always whether it's the cross or whether it's Mary, we don't make an idol out of them, we show our veneration for them and they point us back to Christ. Got it. Hey, if you enjoyed this video and you want to see the full extended version of this podcast, be sure to sign up for our Patreon community for only $5 a month. It'll really help us continue contextualizing the gospel using YouTube, media, and podcasting. And in exchange, you will get full unedited versions of the podcast, of our daily after-party streams, a discount for our merch store, and exclusive access to our private Discord server. It's only $5 a month. The link for Patreon is in the description of this video, as well as the pinned comment below. If you're feeling like, yeah, I don't think I want to sign up for $5 a month, that's okay. We also have links in the description of this video where you can make a one-time contribution on Venmo, Cash App, or PayPal. But but we really want to get you over on Patreon. So again, hit the link in the description, sign up now, and I'll see you over there, all right? Peace.